Hello everyone. I would like to say a warm welcome. My name is Mervi Ispahani. I'm the Academic Programs Manager uh, at Columbia Global Centers Istanbul. Today we're delighted to host our uh, 13th webinar on public and private lives of women as part of our program on Voices of Emerging Scholars led by Professor Zeynep Çelik, uh, Sakıp Sabancı Visiting Professor of Turkish Studies and Professor Tunç Shen, uh, Professor of History uh, at Columbia University. I don't wanna take too much of your time, but we are very happy to uh, actually start the third year uh, of Voices of Emerging Scholars, uh, and we will move on to our discussion very shortly. So uh, before uh, further ado, let me leave the word to Professor Çelik to introduce you to our panelists and today's program. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to our 13th webinar, the first in the current academic year. Together with my colleague, Professor Tun Shen, this year we expanded our time bracket to include the pre-modern era. We will alternate in hosting our seminars to introduce emerging scholars to the broader community. Welcome, Tunch. My gratitude goes to my dear colleagues at Columbia Istanbul Global Center, Ipek Cem Taha, the director, Merve Tezcan Ispahani, academic programs coordinator, and Atatürkol, the program officer as well as to James Leitner for his generous sponsorship. I thank our participants, Oral Valensen, Zeynep Ece Şahin Korkan, and Deniz Gündoğan Ibrishim for their very fine papers. We are most grateful to Dr. Zehra Betül Atasoy for accepting to be our discussant. As some of you may remember, she participated in one of our earlier meetings with a memorable paper on women factory workers in late Ottoman Istanbul. Her knowledge will expand the intellectual boundaries of our panel today. Crossing the disciplines of social history, sociology, architectural history, and literature, today's paper coalesced to examine critical issues around the theme of gender, hence our umbrella title, Public and Private Lives of Women. Chronologically extending from the 1880s to the 1930s, the participants scrutinize how gender was intertwined with economic and class issues, organization of labor, and ultimately progress and development and modernity, those infamous subjects. Among the critical themes they visit are the servant problem, healthcare, and metaphorical engagements with urban forms. They cast light on spaces, from residential buildings to exhibition galleries and to the ruinous fabric of Istanbul. The richness of the topics is echoed in the variety of the sources used, which include novels, diaries, catalogs, periodicals, and visual archives. Let me introduce the participants in the order they will present. Oral Balenson is a PhD candidate in modern Europe and Eurasian history at Yale University and a junior visiting fellow at the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna. The title of his dissertation is Tomorrow Belongs to Me, Coming of Age in the Other Europe. A comparative historian, Oral works on the social and cultural history of labor education and family in Europe, the Middle East, and Central Asia. He has published in the Journal of Social History and has a forthcoming article in the Journal of Austrian Studies. His paper today is titled Deprovincializing Kinship and Domestic Service in Late Ottoman Istanbul. Zeynep Ejishayim Korkan is a PhD candidate at the Technical University of Munich. Her fields of interest include medicine, gender, environmental discourse in architectural history, and the spatial history of museums and display spaces. Currently, she is working on her doctoral research on the late Ottoman medical spaces. 
Zeynep studied architecture at Middle East Technical University and her master's thesis displaying the body anatomy museum and anatomical expressions in architecture focused on the relations between architecture and the human body within the spatial context of anatomy museums, anatomical theaters and medical displays. Her paper is on the feminine, the sanitary and the obscene, 1917 International Ottoman Red Crescent Exhibition. Deniz Gündoğan Ibrishim is Maris Sklodowska Curie Postdoctoral Fellow at Sabancı University at the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. She received her PhD in comparative literature from Washington University in St. Louis with a dissertation titled Trauma, Survival, and Survivance in Contemporary Anglophone and Turkish Literature, Materiality Beyond Mind. Dr. Gündoğan Ibrishim specializes in cultural trauma and memory studies, gender and sexuality studies, post-colonial theory, 20th and 21st century literature, and environmental humanities. She is the co-author of Gaflet, Modern Türkçe Edebiyatın Cinsiyetçi Sine Uçları, which came out in 2019. Her talk today is, an, is titled Mapping Ruin and Ruination in the Early Turkish Republic, Suat Dervish's Cultural and Literary World. Our discussant, Zehra Betül Atasoy, holds a PhD in Urban Systems History from the New Jersey Institute of Technology at Rutgers University. She received her bachelor's degree in architecture and her master's degree in the history of architecture from Istanbul Technical University. Her research focuses on the urban quotidian practices of women and the lived experience of health in the urban environment of early Republican Turkey. She is currently a lecturer at Kadir Has University, Faculty of Art and Design. Let me pass the word on to our first presenter now, Orad. Thank you. Uh, I want to start with the memoir of Hagop Mansuri, who spent his summer vacations in late Ottoman Istanbul selling bread. The job took him to mansions and palaces, but also to, uh, but also to much smaller houses in front of which the young bread sellers had to rely on voice or liked to rely on voice to determine whether the woman who picked up the bread was a young lady, an old lady, a halak, or a baslama. Mintsuri defined halak as unpaid workers who, and I quote, considered members of the household who served until they died. Male servants too were, and I quote, tied to the house until they died. These differed from paid by temporary workers and from beslamalaj, foster daughters raised and married off as charity. While Mintsuri reminisced about Turkish homes, the novelist Ahmet Midat depicted an Armenian Bethlehem serving an Armenian family in Beyoru. In his novel Mushahedat, 18, from 1890, he features Takuhi posthumously. Her impoverished background, exacerbated by her mother's early death, pushed her to domestic service. This occurred a torturously short life. Abused by her master and envied by his wife, she is let go, condemned to wander between employers. Then, after three undesired pregnancies, Takuhi died at the hand of a novice midwife. Such a fate, Midat contended, could not befall a concubine, a jarie. Which concubine became destitute because of her enslavement, he asked, and I quote, how many of them were doomed to remain without a husband? Our concubines are happy, he asserted, because they have a house and children. Such happiness is unknown to the girls of Beyoluz, fortunate families. Fatma Aliyeh further developed this comparison in Women of Islam from 1896. He recounts a conversation with a woman from the European aristocracy. Aliyeh explained that concubines enjoyed not only wages, they received an education, a trousseau, and sometimes even a house upon their guaranteed manumission. Custom and practice worked to the concubine's benefit. She could not forcibly be sold to a buyer whom she disliked, I quote and was still considered a family member long after manumission. 
her independence could come after as little as four years, Aliyesh or her interlocutor. On the other hand, servants, his mechilar, received nothing but money. Not all uh, slaves were Jari Elar, and not all his mechilar or Beslem Elar or Evlat Leklar, so foster daughters. This was true in Europe too. Not all service in Europe was quoted in terms of kinship and came with the promise of independent adulthood. Yet historians of the Ottoman Empire likewise contextualize domestic labor by referring to the mountain historiography on European servants. Nazan Maksudian's study of foster girls benefited from studies of France and England in the 18th century. Maksudian spotlighted the hypocrisy underlying the veneer of charity and kinship. It covered sexual abuse, and it also covered the reluctance of employers to send foster daughters to their own promised independence. Yet, while sexual abuse was the fate of female servants of all kinds, this framing of kinship that would lead to independent adulthood characterized only one particular form of service in Europe. In what follows, I suggest following this kinship dimension of service in Istanbul and in the Bohemian lands can help us understand how the rise of the middle class household shaped the modern city and its labor force. In the Bohemian lands, so modern day Czechia, the word Cheledin referred to this particular type of servant. Derived from a root that means family or household, Cheledini were indeed considered temporary children of the family. Their goal was to amass money for independent adulthood somewhere else. This system, known in the historiography as life cycle service, was rather well regulated. Ordinances defined servants' rights, employers' obligations, and vice versa. They often worked alongside other hired laborers. In agricultural estates, for example, there were also day laborers and cottagers. Wealthy households in the city met their labor needs with specialized employees. These employees, much unlike the Beslem Elar, were often older men, perhaps married, not necessarily living with their employers. All these features set them apart not only from Beslem Malar, but also from Cheledini. One such Chelatka, the feminine form of Cheledin, was Antonia Shalkova, who published her diary in 1962. She entered service in 1884 as a 14-year-old girl. Among her first employers was her aunt. She was also her godmother, and Chalkova hoped that it might improve her status and entitle her even to some part of the inheritance. She was wrong. Then, having left the countryside, she worked for a lawyer who assured her that his servants only left his house to marry. He died, however, leaving three unmarried servants and a wife behind, none of which now had livelihood. By then, she had found the possibility of happiness in marriage as spurious as, and I quote, finding happiness in service. However, she did marry. One widower offered, she accepted, and her diary ends with her gratitude to her new husband, who freed her from, I quote, this gypsy life. Precarity was particularly felt among life cycle servants. They entered service based on the premise that doing so enabled a married adulthood. Such precarity came on top of the harsh conditions of service, which Maxudian and others described, not least in the Ottoman context. A master's son, after dislocating a resistant maid servant knee, said, and I quote again from Shalkova's diary, now you will have to refrain from working. So you deserve to be kicked out by my dad. Yet most employers did not want their servants to leave. Shalkova did so very often. First, she tried to improve her salary, and then when she gave up on a post-service adulthood, she just tried to find suitable permanent employers. Other servants did not accept service as their fate, especially when better paid opportunities emerged in European cities. Kalkova's road included hotels and stores as well, and soon newspapers began reporting on what became the servant question. Retaining servants became difficult. By 1911, the same problem had arisen in Istanbul too. The servant question fleshed out tensions between kinship and labor relations. A landowner's newspaper from Moravia lamented in 1872 how, despite their, and I quote, special place in the family, Chaladini no longer laid their bones where they had entered service early in their youth. A Moravian politician affirmed in 1903 that servants do not want to become slaves. 
to keep them for longer, he suggested increasing their freedom and ensuring that philanthropy governs service relations. In the Swiss city of Bern, one judge even suggested letting servants have their own families. This, of course, would put an end to this life cycle form of service. These kind of suggestions were simply incompatible with service in smaller households, even apartments, that could not afford an entire retinue of domestic staff. And this became soon the majority of employers. Employers and servants were both blamed for corroding their so-called patriarchal relations. A Czech language guide for housewives published in 1891 accused the new household of estranging its servants. Servants, it explained, had to be domesticated. A story published in Hanim Lara Gazete in 1896 suggested that domesticating did not imply permanency. This is the story of a motherless girl brought to Istanbul by muleteers. They promised her father she would learn how to become a lady, but in practice was sold to abusive employers. Her second employer buys her for chip because she escaped. She liked his wife, she worked assiduously and eventually does get married. And so in the second household, the promise is finally fulfilled. The story from 1896 charts the double meaning of education in this kind of relationships. Employers preferred girl servants because they could be raised to obedience and could fulfill all kinds of tasks, but they neglected their obligation to prepare them to become their social equal. They simply could not afford to hire servants who knew from the get-go they would not become their social equals. By the end of the 19th century, labor clearly overshadowed kinship in Veslama contracts. Like the protagonist of Achet Lik, employers increasingly relied on intermediaries like the Smolleteers and not on earlier networks of kinship or local connections, so-called Hemshehirilar. This was also Shalkova's experience in late Habsburg Bohemia. As Yahya Araz and Irfa Kokudash's study of around 1,500 contracts from Istanbul demonstrates, these contracts changed their nature. Employers no longer retained the servants' entire wage as subsistence costs, which is something we can find in Sigilar already in the 16th century. After 1840, paying the girl an agreed amount upon her departure became increasingly common. The increased presence of cash probably decimated spontaneous gifts and highlighted the economic dimensions of this relationship. These girls, of course, were not part of the contracts, but this was the per most persistent feature of life cycle service wherever you look. It took children away from their households. The hiring of Besleme Chalad proved to be not merely a mechanism that balanced labor supply and demand. Theoretically, households use this mechanism to meet their own labor needs by relieving another family of the responsibility of preparing its adolescence for adulthood. This change was not immediately visible. Gülsüm in Rishat Nuri Güntekin's Kizuljik Dalare from 1932 repeatedly calls her foster mother mom. Even though Nadi Dehanem told Gülsüm that she was her mother and that Gülsüm was a child of the house, the narrator notes that it is, and I quote, strange for an Evlat Lik to call the lady of the house by that name. Hints do not help. It is not until she is beaten that Gülsüm calls Nadide Hanim Efendi. Servants were key to the middle class ethos. Recent studies of the middle classes of kinship of labor show that this was not simply a modernizing current emanating from Western Europe outward. The commonalities between Istanbul and the Bohemian lands around 1900 invite us to rethink the ascendancy of the middle-class household and how it proletarianized migrant girls and women. The Ottoman case also complicates ethnic othering in the so-called modernization of domestic service. It undermines the seemingly linear character of this process as it unfolded maybe first in early 20th century Vienna or later in late 20th century Lebanon. In Ottoman Istanbul, enslaved Circassian could, could be more kin-like and even more desirable partner than villager relatives. Choosing to write comparative history, not from the point of view of London, Paris, or Berlin, but from notes like the Ottoman Hab and Habsburg provinces, and as equally important notes, I hope can engender a new and more complete understanding of processes lumped so far under modernization. Such master narratives, I suppose, are much needed. Thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to cede the floor to Zeynep.
Thank you. Hello, I will present you my paper titled The Feminine, the Sanitary and the Obscene, 1917 International Ottoman Red Crescent Exhibition, which is an ongoing research within the scope of my doctoral study on late Ottoman healthcare spaces and medical visual culture. After the proclamation of the Tanzimat Edict in 1839, with the transforming social and political norms, the visibility and activity of women in the Ottoman Empire improved. Ottoman Red Crescent Society, Osman Hilal Ahmer Cemiyeti, inaugurated on April 14, 1877, played a critical role in the modernization process of the empire. Especially during the second constitutional period, the society's activities elevated the social status of women. As the culmination of a grueling and deathful period of more than a decade of consecutive wars, on October 29, 1914, Ottoman Empire joined World War I. There were many social and economic challenges arising from the war, such as food shortages, poverty, epidemics and migration. While being the victims of wartime distress, many women entered professional life and strived for their survival, independence and economic rights in this period. Therefore, despite the tremendous strain war brought to women's lives, wartime has long been regarded as a progressive phase for their liberation from the traditionally set gender roles. This was, in fact, a common phenomenon happening not only in the Ottoman Empire, but also in other warring countries. With the war, the number of working women escalated and gender seclusion diminished, which enhanced women's autonomy. Nevertheless, women's wartime working life experiences were not free from constraints, prejudices and discrimination. On February 1st, 1917, the International Ottoman Red Crescent Exhibition, Hilal Ahmer Sergisi, opened with a grand ceremony in Istanbul and continued for three months. At the opening, many prominent figures such as Sultan, Crown Prince, deputies, ambassadors and bureaucrats were present. The exhibition was organized with the attempts of Red Crescent Society Vice President Dr. Besim Amer Pasha and the exhibition committee was led by Ismail Jambolat Bey, who was the former Under Secretary of the Ministry of Interior. Although there were precedents in Europe, such as the 1898 Red Cross Exhibition in Berlin and the 1893 International Exhibition of the Red Crescent in Rome, the, this exhibition had historical importance as being the very first Ottoman Red Crescent exhibition. The press coverage of the event was immense. In addition to the announcement of the opening ceremony, news and articles were published throughout the year by popular journals like Serveti Funun, and newspapers such as Tanin, Iktam, Tercüman-ı Hakikat, and Tasvir-i Efkar. The venue selected for this momentous international event was Galatasaray High School. Galatasaray Mektebi Sultanisi. The building, which had a notably central location right in the middle of the Grand Rue de Pera, also had political significance in terms of being an imperial symbol of modernity and secular education. During the Great War, while accommodating the high school for boys who had not yet joined the army, it was also used as a hospital with 1500 bed capacity. Within this wartime context, the entire northern ring of the building comprising all three floors was dedicated to this exhibition. Here, the floor plans of the building from the Abdul Hamid archives are shown where the estimated exhibition areas are marked. In this slide, you can see the exhibition layout per level as provided in the guidebook. As stated in the paragraph quoted from the preface of the exhibition guidebook, the exhibition medium was considered one of the major indicators of civilization and an essential component of progress and development. This points out the fact that there were high expectations about the social, political and economic benefits of this exhibition on the way to modernity. The main goal of the exhibition was to shed light on the work and activities of the Ottoman Red Crescent Society and increase its international visibility. The display was built around the idea of getting the attention of people to the damage, cruelty, loss of lives and violation of human rights caused by the war and giving important messages about humanitarian values. In that sense, it was aimed to evoke the feelings of empathy, mercy and sacrifice by reminding the harsh conditions of the wounded soldiers and their families to raise awareness and call for help. 
The concept of compassion was highlighted both in the guidebook and the exhibition itself. A tangible manifestation of this idea can be found in the guidebook where the Ottoman Red Crescent Society was referred to as the Brigade of Mercy. When the exhibition guidebook and the periodicals are probed, it is seen that the 1917 Ottoman Red Crescent exhibition manifested the co-constitutive relationship between wartime health conditions and contemporary gender ideologies. Beyond the conventional spatial segregation of men and women, such as the buffet dedicated to ladies on the first floor, the photographs add more layers to the exploration of this exhibition space from a gender perspective. Among the published images, it is hard to encounter a three-dimensional, full-scale representation of a wounded soldier or even a healthy one. Apart from the scarcity of soldier mannequins, there are no male visitors captured in the photographs. This means that either men did not visit the exhibition much, or the pictures including male visitors were intentionally left out. Contrary to the male representation, women and their image dominate the photographs of the exhibition space. They can be seen in different forms, such as them as enacting nurses working on the battlefield, or as figure depictions on the illustrations about healthcare. During the war, Ottoman women acquired knowledge in nursing and sewing, since the army needed these two occupations in particular. And this condition was vastly depicted in the exhibition. Many women went to the battlefields when necessary and looked after the wounded soldiers there. Ottoman intellectuals supported and praised nursing as a women's profession. Nurses became the symbols of the Red Crescent during the war and appeared frequently on postcards, medallions, rosettes and stamps. The positive attitude towards nurses and caregivers can be observed in the exhibition photographs since they were represented in a clean, neat and beautified way through mannequins, models and images. However, this was not a realistic representation. These nurses risk death while fulfilling their duties and the ones working in the Red Crescent hospitals often resign due to severe working conditions. Women also appear in the guidebook as live displays and as visitors to the exhibition. Room 22, 23 and 24 were devoted to handcrafts produced by women's organizations and their workshops. The photograph of room 22 shows the members of the Women Aid, Women's Aid Societies standing next to their handcrafts, presenting them to the visitors. In the photograph from room 23, artisan women and girls were captured while doing craft work such as weaving and embroidery. In the war years, most sewing was done by poor or refugee women and orphan girls from the Balkans in the Ottoman Red Crescent Society, Ladies Center workshop founded in 1913. The workshop aimed to encourage the immigrants to produce handcrafts and help them to meet their basic needs with the income obtained from the sales of these craft works. With this establishment, women were encouraged to become productive and self-sustaining. It is possible to make a correlation between the main motive of the exhibition, which was to evoke feelings of empathy and compassion, and the pronounced visibility of women. In the official sources and the popular press, stereotypical and highly romanticized role, roles were attributed to women as they were described as guardian angels or devoted helpers. Regardless of the detrimental impact of the war on Ottoman women, they were associated with selfless care and eternal mercy and symbolized as the sacrificing servants of the motherland. During the war, women's bodies became sites of intervention and regulation of the state, and their reproduction became an issue of new policies. In this regard, monitoring and interfering with the sexual lives of women on the home front grew into one of the primary concerns of the belligerent countries. For the Ottoman government, preventive measures against venereal diseases were one of the most effective means to control women's sexuality. Beyond protecting the civilian population, the intention was to keep the soldiers away from sexual transmitted diseases, which hindered the army's strength. Also, these measures helped to set the soldiers' minds at ease about their spouses or fiancés' chastity. Since venereal diseases were transmitted commonly by sexual intercourse, prostitution activities were the main target of these regulations. Although men were the vectors of venereal diseases such as syphilis, the ordinances focused on restricting the practices of female prostitutes. The spread of these diseases was highly associated with the decline of morality and the burden was laid on women. 
The concern about sexually transmitted diseases with respect to Ottoman moral codes was also reflected in the exhibition. Although women and their bodies constituted a significant part of the displays, ironically, their visit to the venereal disease section was limited to a certain time interval. The admission rules to room 7, where moulages demonstrating the physiological effects of venereal diseases were displayed, denotes this situation. The related paragraph in the exhibition guidebook states that, this room was reserved for the visit of only ladies from 2 to 4 o'clock every day in the afternoon. This warning reveals the social moral mindset of the time, which considered women to view genital organ depictions together with men as obscene. On the other hand, it was essential for them to visit the section for educational purposes concerning the growing number of infected women. In this case, the aim of disseminating modern medical knowledge while respecting religious, moral and societal norms was solved by defining restricted access for women. Within the spaces of the 1917 Ottoman Red Crescent exhibition, there were various images of women on display. The contagious disease section located in room 10 included a painting by Dr. Hikmet Hamdi depicting the effects of smallpox disease on a young woman's body. When the specific painting and some other disease paintings of Dr. Hamdi that were later published in Health Museum Atlas are examined, the aestheticized portrayal of sick women draws attention. In the painting seen in one of the exhibition photographs, despite the pain and misery caused by the disease, the young woman seems well-groomed with her pink headband and posing naked body. In this framework, this research reveals that women and their image were cautiously foregrounded around the notions of femininity, sanitation, and obscenity in the 1917 International Ottoman Red Crescent Exhibition. Knowing that the event took place in a symbolically loaded venue that was conventionally designated for male users, this study brings a different dimension to understanding the status and perception of women in Ottoman society during the First World War. Thank you. Um, I will now leave the floor to Dr. Deniz Gündoğan Ibrish. Thank you very much. Um, this study is part of my uh, larger research project on the representation of ruins and ruin geographies in world literatures um, beyond North America and Western Europe. Uh, in my larger project, I focus on the relationship between witnessing, the act of witnessing, and poison geographies, uh, such as sites of nuclear accidents, toxic waste, polluted landscapes, cityscapes, and seascapes. So thereby, within the scope of today's talk, I very much limit my chosen corpus here and offer a narrower picture on the relationship between empire, urban ruins, and Swat Irish's literature. Uh, so my title is Mapping, Mapping Ruin and Ruination in the Early Turkish Republic, Swat Dervish's Cultural and Literary Work. This study focuses on the cultural and literal image of the city, post-imperial Istanbul, through an analysis of Suat Dervish, one of the leading female authors of the late Ottoman Turkish era. It examines Dervish's significant body of work in relation to urban ruins and ruination processes. Ruins are traditionally seen as the sublime remains of empires, such as ancient Greece, Rome, or the Ottoman. Suat Dervish, I propose, takes a slightly different look at the post-Ottoman urban ruins. Rather than emphasizing the romantic nostalgia evoked by sublimely framed edifices, Dervish, in her both fiction and nonfiction, traces ruins that hauntingly mark the fragility of power and the force of destruction in the post-Ottoman urban. In particular, Dervish provides how Istanbul on a global and local stage exposes the complex cities and ambiguities of a metropolitan city deeply connected to the post-imperial ruination. I explore here how post-Ottoman urban is caused in ruins, both physically and psychologically, struggling, abandoned, and in transition in Dervish's works. Ruins appear in their urban and material forms, but even more so in the mindscapes of Dervish's characters, who inherited post-imperial worlds and cities. This study argues that Dervish's works offer a unique insight into a wide range of literal and metaphorical representations of ruined sites linked with both material and spiritual ruins in the metropolis after the fall of the Ottoman Empire. 
While this study is concerned with the examination of Dervish's works from the perspective of ruins and ruination processes, it considers urban ruins as social and psychological facts, and more importantly, as vibrant memory objects, which invoke the uncanny dimension of Turkey's past and the haunting reminders of a troubled transition from the empire to the republic. Thereby, I argue that Swat Dervish's significant body of work points to a particular phenomenon rooted in the once grand and now disintegrating Ottoman mansions on the shores of the Bosphorus and the emergent deranged city in the midst of modernizing drive of the newly independent Turkey. In what follows, I will provide excerpts from Children Gibi, uh, Suat Dervish's fiction, Fosforlu Cevriye, again, uh, her fiction, and Dervish's published interviews in Cumhuriyet Gazetesi, in order to demonstrate the salience of reunion as an essential, and I would argue as an effective concept in her works. Dervish's writers, writings encourage readers to consider ruins as reified things, objects taken out of the flow of time, securely fastened in a static and safe past. At the same time, however, as Dervish's writing suggests, ruins can be effective, active, and alive in the present on the material environment, and more significantly in people's bodies and minds. Dervish's children Gibi follows the story of Celile, a retiring woman from a noble but impoverished Ottoman family her husband Ahmed and her lover Mosin. While the novel revolves around Jelile and her entrapment in a profoundly misogynistic bind and where her life is defined by and dependent on her relationship with men, it makes visible post-imperial urban ruination through a yellow, through a depiction of yellow, a mansion that lead to the present day condition. I quote, on the right side of this yellow, there were storks nesting in chimneys no longer used. All day and all night, the waters of the Bosphorus washed in and out of the boathouse, bringing into Yalu's great halls and abandoned rooms a litany of moans and groans that followed the same rhythm as skipping rope. The marble stairs leading up from the sea were thick with moss right up to the first landing. It was against this backdrop Jelile spent her unusual childhood against this backdrop that she had made her first acquaintance with the world." End quote. The novel begins with the sequence where Jelile grows up in a decaying yellow, a last remnant of Ottoman splendor collapsing into the sands of time. Yellow with its moss, moans, and groans stands as a site that condenses alternative senses of history through ruination to describe the ongoing corrosive process of post-imperial trajectories that also weighs on the present urban environment and more importantly, on the psyche. Cities throughout history have been subject to ruination, whether through war, natural disaster, or technological or social failure. The tendency thus far has been to establish boundaries between the fictive and the real, a related division between aesthetic and political reading of ruins. However, Dervish's text urges the reader that one cannot make such a clear distinction between these categories because they are always entangled. In her nonfiction, in particular throughout her interviews in Istanbul during the 1930s Turkey, Dervish compellingly captures the everyday lives and feelings of exploited and degraded workers precarious women and children in the urban. She traces the entanglement of personal, cultural, environmental costs of post-imperial ruination when the city, with an emphasis on Istanbul in this talk, is caught between material, psychological, and spiritual ruins in the aftermath of the empire. In Jumriyat newspaper, uh, published in uh, 1935, she writes compelling article series entitled Istanbul halkı nerelerde otururlar? Where do Istanbul's live? In Son Posta, published in 1936, Dervish writes the series, Who Gets to Live in the Underground Istanbul? For Dervish, the city is momentous since it provides an alternative panorama of the post-Ottoman within the scope of the modern state 
and the way it foregrounds greens, deprivation, and poverty. The following section is taken from Derviş's piece titled İstanbul Halkı Nerelerde Otururlar? Uh, Tabut ve Tenişir Deposunda Yaşayanlar. Where do Istanbulus live? People who live in coffins and benches. I quote. When you go downhill the land, you could see it, ruined. Wrecked domes, cracked walls, a pile of stone in debris, as if all left after a fire. A cesspool at its doorstep. Perhaps a bypass. Water flows like a river here. As I jump over the river and open a door, one could see canned sardines, a straw hat band, lemon peels, and breadcrumbs, all floating. Just in the middle, beyond the tombstones, a pretty young girl around age eight or nine with fair bangs and in her red cotton print dress raises her head and looks at us." End quote. A very close attention to the description of Istanbul reveals another picture here. This excerpt is a telling example how Dervish exposes a perpetual state of ruins made visibly by decaying inner cities and deprived communities. Dervish brilliantly exposes psychological effects of ruination in contemporary changes of cityscapes, landscapes, and mindscapes. Here I should also mention Dervish's passionate engagement in Marxist ideas at the end of 1930s, which made her write outspokenly about class and social conflicts, both in her fiction and nonfiction. And her interviews uh, uh, during 1930s uh, basically speaks back to her uh, Marxist ideas. I suggest that Darby, Darvish's interviews during and after the 1930s Istanbul should be read together with her Phosphor the JVM, JVM the fire band, if we can translate like that. Throughout her interviews, Darvish responds to read and destruction, both real and imaginary, in an effort to make sense of the past and to an extent envision the future in Istanbul. In this way, Javria offers the reader the specific ways in which peoples and places are laid to waste, where debris falls around, whose life it accumulates, and to be sure what constitutes the rot that remains. Phosphorus Javria wants the reader to track the tangibilities of the aftermath of the Ottoman Empire as material and effective ruins of the urban present. This aspect is visible in one of the scenes where Javria easefully walks through the graveyards of Istanbul. I quote, close to the walls of Istanbul, there was a bostan, a community garden. One of the corners of this bostan was used to be a graveyard a small graveyard. There were four or five tombs and a cyst grave. Fig trees used to grow in that postan where you could see some figs as big as my fist. You can never find figs like those in any neighborhoods of Istanbul. Just at the back of the postan, there were forsaken lands, ruins, which they used to call loopholes. This is the place where one can fall asleep with ease." End quote. As seen, Tracing the relationship between ruination and the city in Dervish's literature enables the unique case of continuation and the subversive use of ruins in everyday lives of her fictional characters. This scene also reveals a contrast between modern civic development imperatives and otherwise reception of post-imperial ruins. It at the same time illustrates who uh, what produces ruins, what defines ruins, and how they affect women here in cities and in general civilizations on levels from the visual, imagined, formal, to the philosophical, and to be sure, to the psychological. Jebri here not only makes the reader rethink the nation's unending quest to claim, map, and occupy physical space, but also of the transgressive, and I would say feminist ways of how one can inhabit and to an extent contest those post-imperial spaces. As for a conclusion, rethinking Swat Dervish's work in the early years of the Turkish Republic through urban ruins and ruination is significant as it will allow readers and scholars to unearth a new post-imperial discourse. The entanglement of imaginative and real, of physical and mental, of public and private forms of ruination. It is at this point that this interlaced feature of ruination in Dervish's works 
reveals the contrast between modernity and empire. Dervish's depiction of reunion is what people are left with on so many levels. What Dervish offers here is the long-term understanding and inertia of imperialism, the ruination that doesn't end with post-imperial and modernizing processes. Her works embrace the fact that post-imperial and modernist processes fundamentally alter societies and psychologicals in the ur ur modernized urban, and that these altered states are still ongoing features of a post-imperial society in powerful phase. In this way, we are introduced to the enduring quality of imperial remains and multi-layered status of these imperial leftovers as individual, social, cultural, and environmental heritage, but even more so as transgressive memory work in Swat Dervish. Thank you very much for listening. Um, and uh, and the, just a side note, translations from Istanbul Halk Nerilerde Otururlar and Fosforlu Cevriye, unless otherwise uh, indicated, are my own in this study. Thank you. First of all, um, thank you very much for this opportunity to take part in this amazing session. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed this very thought-provoking papers. So uh, the papers complement each other in various ways, but I will um, go over them individually. First, I will start with uh, Oral's paper. So um, your research question is very intriguing and the comparative study looks promising. It's made me wonder if uh, there would be any um, other possible comparisons with other European contexts. Um, domestic servants who were typically brought from rural areas at a young age were viewed as a threat to society's morals and public health um, during the period of your examination because of their uh, solitary existence in public spaces and their uncontrolled sexual and other relationships with men. Hence, we see a call to control the visible uh, lower class woman. Takui's history uh, in your paper is illuminating in that regard. My questions would be, um, what was the general public's opinion of these domestic workers trying to find jobs in the cityscape? And um, how did this uncertain future of for independent adulthood affected women's visibility uh, in cities? Of course, it is a short paper, but it might be uh, useful to look into the blurring lines between a domestic servant at least the aftermath uh, where they were unable to achieve independent adulthood and prostitution. So I would like to hear uh, your thought on this interrelation as well. Moving on to Zeynep's paper, um, as you have mentioned, there was an improvement in women's employment. However, once again, uh, we see women being restricted, restricted to certain professions assigned by men, such as nursing in this case. Um, we trace a synopsis of these prominent issues surrounding women's status and employment in the exhibition's content, temporal and spatial configurations. These in your paper were uh, particularly appealing to me. Uh, women would be praised and supported if uh, they did not challenge the boundaries structured by men, right? In terms of gender spaces, uh, it was important to note that in this exhibition too, men could move freely in both moral and uh, immoral zones, whereas women were admitted to the venereal diseases section for only two hours. I'm curious first, uh, was there a reaction uh, to women visiting this section in the media? And finally, in the infectious diseases section, there is a depiction that is not actually dramatized. We do not see the terrible effects and pain of smallpox. Uh, however, in the venereal diseases section, uh, we see a three-dimensional display technique. I believe it was way possible to see the devastating effects uh, of syphilis more clearly there. Uh, I'm wondering if you might be able to say something about these two distinct depiction choices, as well as how this might relate to a larger picture of uh, femininity and public health. Finally, uh, Denise's paper um, 
this is a great investigation. You employ materials that are frequently overlooked in other disciplines. For example, in architectural and urban history literature, Istanbul was generally described as a static city in the early Republican period. And the city was uh, primarily studied, studied primarily from the standpoint of decision makers, such as government officials and planners. And this resulted in a body of literature focusing on physical aspects of the city rather than the inhabitants. Hence, I, I truly appreciate how you contextualize urban ruins as active agents, act active spaces animated by uh, ordinary people. So you explore the decaying yellow stock and the ruins in various neighborhoods. Uh, the ruination processes, however, were also happening in the late Ottoman Istanbul. There were quite a few fireplaces and ruins in Surici uh, and Galata. For example, Teneke Mahalleleri were familiar scenes, but the same rate, the same pace of decay cannot be argued for the mansions on the Bosphorus. So do you think uh, Suat Darish distinguishes these two rates of ruination uh, between yellows and other ruins while using the uh, urban environment to enrich her fictional characters? Another note that um, she depicts the lives of the working class and poor women in the urban ruins, as well as the uh, middle, middle and upper middle classes living in modern Istanbul. Um, ruins were not the only locations where the empire gave way to the Republic. For example, Chilgun Gibi also took place in apartment buildings in Nishantashi. Jelile's journey uh, was reflected first in the Yolo and then in a modern apartment building. In this transitory period, both decaying and modern neighborhoods coexisted in an individual uh, women's life cycle. So it may be fruitful to examine this coexistence um, in Dervish's narratives to understand the ruination processes better. I would like to hear your thoughts on this coexistence. Um, now I will leave the floor once again to the participants before uh, moving on to the audience. Okay, uh, thank you for the thoughtful comments. Uh, I will give brief answers first, and if we want to develop anything in the q and I would be happy. Um, so I would start by saying that, yes, there are more comparisons to make both in the Ottoman Empire and further in Europe. Um, the bigger chapter this lecture is taken from also brings into the picture um, the case of Iceland and um, the treatment, the discourse around slavery in the uh, Turkic part of the Russian Empire in the 19th century after the conquest. Um, I think, however, that in order to make this comparisons more fruitful, we have to kind of think what might make one place unique over the other. So the case of Istanbul, for example, in the comparative literature was often either one where European servants came, right, as governesses, for example, or the part where, um, yeah, so, you know, we have servants, they have domestic slaves. And I was keen on showing how this um, works together, especially because there, is, there are hints in literature about other Ottoman places which can guide further inquiry. For example, Michael Bear's works on slavery um, have fruitful hints that indeed, for example, households in mid 19th century Egypt that had both domestic uh, slaves and servants sometimes gave the harder work to the servants and not to the enslaved. Um, about prostitution and threats. Yes, absolutely. This is one of the places where Ottoman and European coalesce more, most clearly. Uh, we have myriads of people from mayors in Greece warning people not to send girls to Istanbul or to Alexandria uh, because their simple village moral can, be, can contaminate them easily in the city. We also have European missionaries running around the Ottoman Empire trying to capture freed uh, enslaved women and turn them into domestic servants. And we have this feeling from Cairo to St. Petersburg, basically, that women who become domestic servants are prone to become prostitutes. Wherever we do have, let's say, police records from cities like Berlin and in, and in Cairo, we know that, that it is the most frequent uh, former occupation 
of uh, women either in uh, regulated prostitution or in illicit, um, illicit prostitution. What I find, however, intriguing about the Ottoman case, uh, which is why I chose to kind of develop this comparison, which I again do more in my dissertation, is because it seems like in Ottoman discourse, we have much more emphasis on the fault of the employer vis-a-vis -vis the European emphasis on the fault of the either girls or the fault of the um, of the fleeting servants who wanted to improve their um, their chances. So for example, perhaps the biggest, the latest great novel that was written in Greek in Istanbul by uh, Dimitrios Melisopoulos from 1897 is called I Ipiretria, the uh, domestic servant. And in this novel, we see how um, a master kind of raises a domestic servant, but he only raises the servant to um, become his own wife, which is not something he's supposed to do. He tells her either you're growing to become my wife and get educated and everything, or you are basically getting nothing. She chooses to become educated, kind of deceive him into becoming his wife, but then run away with the person whom she um, fell in love with. And I felt like this kind of focus on the vicious plans of the employers, their impure intentions makes the Ottoman case much more intriguing. Unfortunately, I think that I have most information on Istanbul. I hope this will change. I hope we'll be able to see more, not only on a discursive level, which makes, let's say, comparison to Qajar Iran possible, but not on the social level, which eventually is what interests me. So yes, there is more room for comparisons. Yes, they were seen as a threat. And I think that by following the threat, we can see not only how the strive for control was discursively shaped, but also by looking at the differences, we can also see how on the ground, different opportunities were available to this um, new girls in the city. I, I may continue. Um, thank you, first of all, Dr. Atasoy, for your insightful comments and uh, inspiring questions. Uh, firstly, I can say that according to the guidebook, the exhibition opened every day at 10 o'clock in the morning and closed at half past seven in the evening. And in general, uh, there are no restrictions uh, or distinctions made between the male and female visitors' entrance and exit times, except for this very venereal disease section. And uh, so far, the publications I have examined do not mention the section or discuss the section or include any images from that specific section. And uh, however, we can uh, find some other traces of gender relation related issues in these periodicals. Uh, with respect to this exhibition. Um, for instance, the article published in Tarjuman Hakikat heralding the opening of the exhibition, um, a dedicated hall for women attending the ceremony is mentioned, for example. And also uh, it's written that a few days after the opening, um, the show organized by the um, I.S. Stefanos Red Crescent Ladies branch was watched by ladies during the day and by the gentlemen in the evening. So we see another uh, distinction there. Um, and moving to your uh, second question, um, I can say that the impact of syphilis on the society was tremendous and the disease uh, profoundly affected the public. So the three-dimensional representation might have been selected uh, on purpose to gather the attention of people more and influence them more and maybe even scare them more to make them more cautious and conscious in this uh, matter. And uh, as I mentioned in my presentation and uh, as you also touched upon, um, the this issue about venereal diseases was highly related to uh, morality and uh, moral codes of the Ottoman society and um, the increase in the venereal diseases uh, became a moral problem in the society and um, I can give an example um, which which is very striking I found very striking it's um, on uh, nine, in 1919 uh, there is an article published in the times 
Uh, and the title of this article was Decadent Turkey, Muslim Virtues Fast Disappearing. And this article drew attention to the increasing number of women who had venereal diseases in Istanbul. And it claimed that about 40,000 women had such uh, diseases in a city of 1 million inhabitants, which is very striking. And these venereal diseases uh, were not affecting the daily life only in Istanbul, but also in Anatolia all around the empire. So I, I can say that this uh, three-dimensional uh, representation could be related to this impact of this diseases of these, yeah. Maybe I can jump in now. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, great question. Uh, I think I might be uh, pick up on this yellow and apartment, uh, maybe a coalition and or the separation. But as you um, uh, mentioned, the urban has been uh, described as a kind of a static state uh, by policymakers or decision makers, but not necessarily uh, by inhabitants. So I think Swat Darvish uh, brilliantly uh, does this job. Uh, Yellow and its relation to this built environment and ruination. Uh, in children to be in the shadow of the yellow, there is this decaying yellow, a very beautiful and can uh, a post imperial Istanbul phenomenon, we can say. It's static and close within itself uh, through individual and collective memories. And also, it is at some point embedded in transnational memories. Uh, so we can maybe say that it is frozen at some point. And if I'm not mistaken, in the novel, there was a moment when the narrator tells something like this. Uh, Jelile uh, really was the child of that 40 room yellow, cut off uh, from the real world, floating in its own legend. So it created its own legend. It's, you know, uh, closed uh, within itself. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it disturbs this linear, I think, human historical narratives of urbanization, narratives of modernization, or narratives of uh, progress at some point. Uh, but of course, uh, with that, there are apartments. Uh, we see uh, the depiction of apartments, Istanbul apartments, especially uh, in Firuza, Talimane, and of course, in Nishantashi, for example, in Chulgun Gibi. Um, I'm not an uh, you know urban architecture. I'm not an uh, expert on urban architecture. Istanbul, uh, but uh, Istanbul met with the apartment culture at the end of uh, eight, uh, at the end of the century, and this culture began to uh, develop in the early nineties. Uh, and apartment type buildings, which were also built uh, especially by non-Muslims uh, in the Ottoman uh, period, and survive to the present. Uh, so usually, what we see is a big family buys that apartment and it becomes a kind of a family apartment and we see this depiction uh, in children Gibi as well for example Seyfullah the old butler uh, after buying his village grocery store he also buys a, a three-room apartment above it and then uh, his family uh, leaves it uh, his uh, somehow um, servants lives uh, in the apartment uh, and of course, we do have a, for example, a character, uh, Ahmed. Uh, he is so ambitious and determined, and he becomes a very successful businessman. Uh, and uh, his main aim is to buy the apartment, to buy an apartment, and then to buy a mansion uh, in the island. So I think uh, when you put apartment vis-a-vis uh, -vis this depiction of uh, yellows uh, in Swat Dervish's children Gibi. Apartment, uh, I think, uh, is also linked with raising status, having this capital, having this finance, especially for the male figure uh, in the novel. And somehow is it, it is associated with capital accumulation and production of built environment. So it's totally uh, speaks to this uh, modernizing uh, projects uh, after the uh, after the fall of the Ottoman Empire, but also it is I think very contested here. Also, we see a, a different um, uh, perception of apartment, for example, Muhsin's apartment in Nishantish in Chulgun Gibi, uh, and Jelile as Muhsin's lover. Uh, locks herself in that particular apartment and waits uh, for his lover in agony. Uh, 
So again, it becomes a kind of static space, enclosed uh, space uh, for Jelile uh, because uh, she is in pain uh, uh, because of her love. Uh, so I think uh, Swat Dervish really beautifully uh, plays uh, with the idea of this public and private idea of uh, yellows and built environments and maybe uh, uh, wants the reader to see that they are always, you know, uh, entangled and there's no a kind of a neat separation uh, between uh, these two, I think, if that answers your question. Thank you. Uh, so maybe we can move on to the discussion now. Uh, maybe it's interesting to see. I mean, thank you very much for all these uh, brilliant papers. And your papers actually speak very nicely to one another. Uh, so just a point to start off the discussion. Um, it, it's so interesting that, Dennis, uh, the way you make this distinction, this assumed distinction between fictive and real and aesthetic and political reading of the ruins, and you you go against that distinction, and it's a very I think it's very um, as a as an instrument that's very useful to understand and uh, grasp the the cityscape and as you say the mindscapes uh, of Swat Dervish and Oral. You also use a you know different number of literary sources. Uh, you use Sal Salcola's diary. Ahmed Mitad's Mishadat, and you use also Fatma Aliye. So you bring together all these anecdotes uh, that give us some idea of domestic service in the Ottoman Empire and and and and um, and elsewhere. But um, I'm still curious to know uh, what other sources are out there that can actually uh, help this uh, help your study, you know, enrich this uh, your your study because. Uh, because you mentioned about, you know, these blurred categories between Jariye, Besleme, so, uh, but, and also about contracts. So I'm curious uh, if you had a chance to, you know, look at any court records, divorce uh, cases or uh, inheritance cases. How can we really hear the voices of, of these uh, female workers under domestic service on everyday conflicts? Uh, so that's just one um, question. And uh, Zeynep, I mean, and as you draw this uh, really interesting comparative study on domestic service, uh, and I'm listening Zeynep, and I can't stop of thinking of, you know, comparisons because nursing at, at the time of war is a profession in the making. So it has no clear definitions, you know, it encapsulates variety of tasks caring, take, taking care of wounded soldiers, preparing meals, and also like um, doing, you know, surgical operations to some extent, but it's in the making. Uh, so, and you bring this, so you show us how the physical space of the exhibition uh, was gendered. So it's very clear from the photographs, but th those images are striking in such a way that how they collapse all these gendered roles because what we see in those pictures is this image of this you know masculine vulnerability of wounded soldiers versus you know these uh nurses uh and they're like guardian angels so the strong uh female image they're so cold-blooded and this is like that pretty much, you know, in all the depictions of this era, it's interesting to see, for instance, with the British Red Crescent, uh, those images. So I'm curious to know um, if you also study, you know, uh, like drug comparisons or, you know, nurses in Gallipoli and uh, British nurses in Gallipoli in other places or in other fronts. So uh, that it, it would really um, help to, you know, inform uh, to you know, uh, think about those uh, comparative uh, spaces if if you have worked on them. Um, maybe I can start by um, answering your questions. Thank you for your uh, comments, and also thank you for the uh, for finding out the interesting relations between these uh, different studies. And um, I can say that. Uh, Focusing on the First World War, there is a great interaction between the central powers um, 
uh, the countries who fought with the Ottoman, together with the Ottoman Empire, such as uh, German forces, uh, Austro-Hungarian forces, and also Bulgaria, and we see uh, their Red Cross uh, societies, the representation and presentation of the these Red Cross societies within the exhibition space of this Ottoman Red Crescent exhibition, and also these. Uh, societies from other countries, they also provided physical and uh, moral help to the Ottoman Empire for this exhibition to take place. We see that in the records, they provided material, they provided financial support. So there was a great alliance between these countries within the context of health care and the relationship between Red Crescent and Red Cross societies. And um, when we specifically uh, look into the lives of these nurses and the interactions between nurses from different um, lands and different geographies, we see that there is a lot of there is a, a lot of mobility happening in these years, and we uh, see that uh, nurses from especially from the central powers coming and going to the Ottoman Empire and working in the hospitals and even involving in the educational aspect of this profession and providing real help uh, for the growth of this profession. So I can say that these uh, connections between these uh, forces that fought together is quite visible and pronounced within the scope of this war. Okay, uh, I will say a few words about the sources. Uh, everything has to do with contracts and reading the CGLR, I mostly um, here. I mostly here uh, rely on new work uh, by Yahya Arad and Irfan Kokdash, who have been publishing quantitative studies. I myself do not study uh, court records. Narrative sources, however, are both scarce and problematic. Even in the uh, Turkish context, it's so much easier to find narratives written by men about um, these women. So this is obviously. And not, a, not an easy task. However, if you look at this theoretically, we should be able to find many of them because we assume that if the system worked and these servants indeed fulfilled the purpose of service, accumulated money, and were able to marry, then of course they just become middle class women who are able to write. And we do have some of that. However, we find that um, long treatments of periods of service are, are either hidden away from their autobiographies, and I speak here in very broad terms, but it again, quite depends. For example, I've been spending the last few uh, months in both Athens and in Vienna going over kind of informal civil society projects to collect autobiographies of women, which are extend in the hundreds. And you can see how, for example, those who, are, who have become middle class try to kind of sweep away their time of service. They kind of mention this, but then they believe they have done more important things in life afterwards. In the case of Shankova, for example, her diary was published when she was nearly 80. Uh, she published this by request of the communist regime in Czechoslovakia to kind of show why we need to fulfill the promise of eradicating service, which we know is also kind of a problematic narrative to consider because there immediately was published another one by, you know, the press was still free that says, no, I was a servant and I liked it. So we have two servant diaries published in Czech in the 1950s around the same year, one kind of invited to show the dark side of service, one saying, no, it's actually great, I've been a servant my entire life. And uh, we see how the only way that such narratives can be, um, can be interwoven into a, into a picture is mainly by finding very short ones, sometimes one page, two page long, published in socialist newspapers, in women movements newspapers, sometimes as brochures that were published, you know, that were lectures transcribed and kept in small party archives, which I have from places like uh, Zurich, which has a very big social archive, and from Albania, uh, where we, you had some women organizations whose archives are kept in the National Archives. But since these women either preferred not to talk about this period or did not become members of society who write their memoirs and have them archived or let alone published, um, the sources are indeed scarce if you are not going to the court. Yeah. 
Thank you. Uh, we have a question uh, from Hivya Adak uh, for Dennis. Uh, could you please discuss how Swat Dervish is unique compared to her contemporaries? Uh, how would you compare her to other writers and women of her time? And secondly, have you had a chance to explore the reception of Swat Dervish's works? How do you explain the dismissal of Swat Dervish from various literary canons and literary scholarship during the last few decades? Thank you very much for this great question. Um, maybe I'll, I'll just um, uh, pick up on this last one because I think it's quite important uh, because there has been a kind of a revival uh, on Swat Dervish's uh, literature uh, for maybe the for, for past uh, five years or so. Uh, Swat Dervish uh, was educated in Germany where uh, she wrote articles for newspapers and journals. Uh, but after the rise of uh, fascism, she returned to Turkey in 1932. Uh, and then uh, mostly she became renowned for, for, for her novels, which were, uh, you know, uh, serialized in Turkish newspapers. Uh, but also she was a very dedicated socialist. She was put on trial for her book, uh, Why Do I Admire Soviet Russia? And sentenced to eight months in uh, prison. After her release and change of government uh, in Turkey, she fled to France and she lived in exile from, I think, 1953 to 1963. Uh, but she remained very active in politics. Uh, in 1970, she was uh, very active. Uh, when the Turkish left was on the rise, uh, again, she helped the foundation of the Socialist Women Association. And of course, she was very close friends with Nazım Hikmet. And she was a very key figure uh, examining this conflictual you know, aspect of being a woman uh, with a Marxist perspective, I would say, uh, within a traditional society. Uh, so this exile, uh, living in exile and dedicated to Marxism within a traditional society, I think these, you know, features uh, somehow affected her reception those times. Uh, there was a silent moment uh, in those times. So at some point she had to uh, stand and say, no, I'm Swat Dervish, the writer. So she had to defend her, her agency uh, as a woman and as a writer. But I think uh, today things have been changing uh, almost a half a century later. Uh, now she's known in Turkey as the writer who was erased from the history, who was erased from the uh, literary canon. Uh, and I think it has some, uh, this has also some uh, risks uh, in itself, uh, having this label of forgotten or ignored, uh, you know, female figure. But now at least her books are being reissued uh, by Itaki Yayınları, um, a very uh, successful symposium and exhibition uh, have been held recently. Uh, and there was a, a biography written by Liz Behe Moras, uh, a biography of uh, Suat Dervish. Uh, so I think there is a very, you know, a vibrant uh, cultural and literary environment now claiming uh, back to uh, Suat Dervish's uh, roots and uh, pulling her literature uh, into the uh, contemporary moment. But I think uh, that uh, she, being a key figure uh, in that very peculiar time, being a key Marxist figure defending women's rights. And when you think about uh, the relationship between Marxism and feminism, it's a whole another huge topic, a very uh, contested topic. I think those aspects uh, led uh, to a kind of a silent period um, uh, on Swat Dervish's reception. If there are no questions, I would like to say a few things, which are not really questions, but these are the themes that triggered me as you were making your presentations. And thank you very much again for your wonderful presentations. I discussed them with you individually. However, there are some things that I didn't think of as you were talking. One of them, and I'll go in the order that you presented, Listening to Oren again, I began to consider uh, the hierarchy within the domestic uh, servants in the household. And I was thinking about the foreigners, 
the governesses, the nannies, and especially their very, um, very uh, key relationship with the man, with the man in the family. And I think um, we come across these uh, foreign women, especially in novels, uh, but it is a phenomenon that comes all the way to today. I know of so many people of my age and younger who were raised by English nannies, or they had German um, governesses, and of course, French governesses. And there was a little bit of uh, condescension towards these women, yet they occupied a special place in the household. So that makes me wonder about other subtle hierarchies within the domestic work, uh, just a thought. And again, foreign nurses uh, made me think of, uh, I hadn't thought about that, Zainab, thank you for bringing that up. But I thought about something else as I, uh, as an architectural historian, uh, um, listening to you. The bizarre the, or the, the multi-purpose uh, of these modern buildings in the uh, late Ottoman society, and high schools are especially meaningful that way. They are built for education, but they're used as hospitals. They're used as concert halls. They are used as exhibition halls. You showed, um, you showed us, and, and I figured out um, uh, only a few months ago that they were also used as uh, museums in the late Ottoman Empire. So that, and then of course, when you think of an important Republican Congress like Sivas Congress being held in a high school. So one building did a lot for the um, modernity of the late empire and even the Republic later on. And then as listening to you, like Betu, I was thinking of the, um, of the gaps in writing urban history of the um, early Republic. Uh, we have these neat projects, and yet these neat projects do not, for example, Prost, have, uh, everybody has heard of only Prost, right? But, what about the spaces that were in between? And um, very few people, um, one of them is Petrin who started looking into those spaces. And I'm relearning the importance of um, cross-disciplinary research and the importance of literature, how much we learn. Uh, from Phosphor Lugeria as we go through the different neighborhoods of Istanbul. With the big question in my mind, how did Swat Dervish learn about them? Coming from an upper class family and really not growing, but she knows what she's talking about. So these are just a few thoughts and I'm hoping we will have some more questions. But if not, Marve, what do you say? Yes, maybe we can um, close our session. Uh, thank you very much to our audience and to our wonderful speakers um, today. It was a great discussion. And I thank you all very much for your wonderful papers and um, your dedication. Thank you.